started. If you want to move towards the front, that'd be great. Uh, so welcome to Controlling the Bull in the China Shop, addressing privilege, power, and identity, and externship teaching and programming. And I must say that our title sounds like we're going to solve a really big issue in about 90 minutes. Um, but I, I do think what we'd like to do is uh, scratch the surface of an issue that confronts all of us in teaching law students about becoming lawyers, and then conversations about power um, and voice and being heard and being validated, which I feel like is an underlying theme of, of probably the next couple of days. Um, so how we wanted to just start off was to introduce ourselves so you have an, an idea of who's in front of you and what we're going to, the lens through which we are going to deliver our, our words. And we're also going to pass out um, after that, pass out just some pieces of paper for you to write down questions or challenges that, that you wanted to address in this time, and then have a little bit of a conversation. Um, so I'm Carmia Caesar. I think I'm introducing you because of, I don't know, I'm on the right side of the table. Um, <laughs> uh, I am an externship, I'm the director of experiential learning at Howard University School of Law. I've been externship teaching off and on for uh, the last almost uh, 15, 16 years. First at Howard, then back in practice, then at Georgetown, uh, and now uh, a much celebrated return to Howard. And so I'm speaking about these ideas um, from the lens of being in a majority minority setting. Hello, uh, I'm Lexi Freeman. I'm an associate professor of the practice um, and director of externships and public interest initiatives. It's a very long title um, at Denver Law. Um, I've been in this role for almost five years, um, and um, prior to this role, um, and, and for me, I'm not sure this about her either, but prior to this role, was um, sort of actively a social justice uh, lawyer, um, supporting movements. Um, and I think all of us bring our practice experience into sort of why we care about these issues and how we talk about them. So I just want to that. Um, and I'm uh, Sarah Jackson. I'm the director of externships at UC Davis School of Law in California um, and had the pleasure of working with both Lexi and Carmen in previous lives. Um, I was previous to Davis at Georgetown Law School in their public interest office and previous to that um, was also a social justice practitioner um, at an organization in Washington, D.C. with Lexi and then also in San Francisco. Um, so yes, definitely. Where are we all? Yes, in all three of them, work that organization. Yeah. So, um, yes, I've drawn all of that in my in my current role. Hi, I'm Monica Blackstone Kasha. I'm visiting professor um, in the externship program at Seattle University School of Law. Um, and um, yeah, I, I I am grateful to be on this panel. I feel like as a visitor, maybe some of you are visiting. Um, I tell people it sort of symbolizes how I feel about life. I feel like we're all visiting our bodies and we're just passing through. We'll see what happens, right? But I say that because I've been very grateful to be part of this panel. Every time I meet these three fine, fabulous folks, I uh, want to be with them, but I never know if I will be here next year. So I'm, two years ago, we came together um, at this conference in uh, England, and um, I'm so grateful to be here before practicing, um, before uh, being in this role, I've, I've taught in the immigration clinic at the law school as well, and I used to practice immigration. Um, so, what we've, we've, we've introduced ourselves, but we'd love to hear exactly who's in the room and where you teach and what you're, like, how you've been categorized, I guess, or classified <laughs> for, um, and then we'll get one. Yes, sir. I'm, I have been a clinician, an uh, in-house clinician most of my career. Um, I have not been an in-house clinician for the next, for the past three years, because I was an associate dean. Um, and now I am teaching a, a, a criminal law uh, residency program, which is like a high credit externship. Oh, can you just get you, I, some of us that are newer to the world, can you do name in school as well? I'm sorry, don't know everyone. Kate Cruz, um, Great. Mitchell Hamlet School of Law. Great. I am Rob Rossa, Ave Maria, and teach a legal intern in the, and handle the externship program. And I realized I'm in the wrong room. So I'll be departing soon, and I didn't want you to think there was any reflection on the quality <laughs> of the panel or the 
Um, hi, I'm Cecily Banks. I'm at Boston University. I'm directing their corporate counsel externship program and in the um, transactional lawyering faculty. Um, Amy Sanker, and I'm at the University of Michigan Law School, and I'm the director of the externship program and the pro bono program. Hi, I'm Kurt Nesset. <coughs> I'm here at UGA, and um, among other things, I direct the capital assistance project, which is a capital punishment externship. Start the yeah. back, yeah. Um, my name is Sombra, I'm based and at UCLA. I do not have a legal background. Um, I'm the externship program manager <coughs> with Decent Need, and, but I have an extensive student development and critical race theory, critical gender theory background. I'm Kurt Mason, I'm the director of clinical and experiential education, and I just, I've seen some of your work before, and I've just played love. I'm a follower. I'm Carolyn Larmore from Chapman in uh, Orange County, California. I'm the director of externships and um, professor of practice. And I apologize for not moving, but I'm going to have to duck out for a call. Hi, I'm Catherine Klein. I'm uh, at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. and am the director of Columbus Community Legal Services, which is our in-house clinical program. Hi, Lisa Bliss from Georgia State University. Atlanta. I'm an in-house clinician. I work at an MLP clinic and an associate dean of experiential education. I'm Paul Bennett from the University of Arizona, clinical director here. Terry Wright from Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, um, externship director. Bridget Ortega, Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, uh, assistant dean of experiential learning. I'm Nancy Moore at Albany Law School in New York, and um, I'm the director of our extension program. Um, I'm Susan Brooks at uh, Drexel in Philadelphia, and um, I'm an associate dean for experiential education. Hi, I'm Jenna Smith from Windsor Law, which is uh, in Ontario, Canada, and I am was our academic clinic director, but I'm starting an externship program in the fall. <laughs> My name is Allison Lintel. I am the director of our externship program. I also teach the program and also director of career services office at um, did I say Penn State Dickinson Law in uh, Carlisle. Um, Meg Reuter at University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, director of the field placement program, associate program professor. Rebecca Rowley Show, I'm at Wayne State University in Detroit, and I'm assistant director for the externship programs, and I also um, teach the colloquium courses in the colloquium. Some of them. Thank you. We think it's, you know, especially when you're doing a topic, I think of like power, privilege, and identity, I think it's really important to recognize that you all are taking time to be here too. So while I think one sentence of who you are doesn't begin to, I think, give credit to what you do, um, we at least wanted to make sure I think it's worth the five minutes of knowing who's in the space. So thank you. Um, all right, yeah, so I'm going to start us off, and I, I feel like my remarks are a bit stream of consciousness, but in part kind of going to the fact that most of us wear multiple hats, um, and certainly in my role at UC Davis, I actually, in some ways, I feel like, I mean, my externship hat is part of it, but it's under the student, student, student services umbrella, so I, I really wear a lot of student services and student support hats, um, through which I'm very aware of the impact that law school has on all students, um, but I think particularly, I mean, we kind of, and there's a lot of ways to phrase it, but students from kind of more underrepresented or marginalized backgrounds. Um, and so I think law school can be inherently dehumanizing, unfortunately, I wish it weren't that way, um, but I think that is more true sometimes for some students than others. Um, and this has a really big psychological impact on a lot of our students between, you know, kind of the rigors of law school, between the imposter phenomenon that some students feel, the pressures to excel, um, you know, macro and microaggressions that, again, do not fall evenly on our students. Um, and there's just there's really limited space in law school, with I think some exceptions, to unpack and engage and discuss systemic racism, sexism, oppression. Um, and I think that comes out in their doctrinal classes and certainly comes out in what they see in practice. And I think one of the things that we actually have space to do as externship faculty and practitioner and folks in student services roles um, is create spaces where it's okay to engage those issues and where actually I think we have responsibility to. Um, and I find that when I make the space to do that in my classroom, which, which I will also acknowledge is an ever-evolving process for me, um, 
I'll, I'll just, I mean, I'll, kind of, I'll be transparent in that I absolutely, like, I am always trying to do this better. Um, and so I'm always trying to make sure that I'm taking on issues of power and privilege and engaging them. And every semester I'm like, oh man, I would, you know, oh, I, there, there was a blind spot and I'd like to figure out how I could do that even better. Um, and trying to balance, so I'm in a fairly diverse law school, both in terms of faculty and students, um, but trying to balance educating kind of more privileged students um, and raising their own self-awareness with also creating um, so more kind of directly and specifically supporting students, um, students of color, students from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and sometimes to me those things can feel in tension, um, so I'd be curious if that feels true for, for you all too. Um, but I do think at a minimum that it's really important to create those spaces. And I find that when I do, even in applied setting like externships, sometimes we'll end up having conversations that bring a more critical lens to doctrinal classes as well, um, and how the law plays out at the work that they're doing in the field. And I find that valuable. And that, that can happen both in class, and I find that that also happens then back in my office um, when we're talking about, you know, what do you think about this career path, or, you know, how is, just how is law school going for you? Um, so I'm just going to touch on a few kind of eclectic ways that I engage these issues both in my seminar um, as well as in some of the other hats that I wear um, and then I'll turn it over to others. Um, so in my seminar, first of all, my seminar is a multi, um, it's, and it's too many students, frankly, uh, it's usually 30 to 40 and it's multi-placement. Um, I'm working on, I'm hoping to improve that so that it can be smaller and more discursive, but um, that's how it's been this year. Um, and there are, there are definitely pros and cons to that. Um, but one thing that I try and do at the beginning, because I'm aware that there's a vulnerability to some of the some of what we work with in seminar, which is the professional identity and figuring out, you know, who you want to be and what it, what you know what Lauren feels like to you where you are. Um, and so I take some time to set ground rules um, with the intention of making the classroom kind of as safe as inclusive as possible. So everything from there are no dumb questions here. Um, you know, some of you this may for many students it's their first time in a professional setting, and there's just a lot of discomfort in navigating those spaces. So you know, all of that kind of stuff. You know, don't assume that everybody knows what they're doing. Um, we're in part here to learn about and be respectful of each other's experiences. But the other ground rule that I have found um, both helpful and I, I think helpful to students um, is the outside world exists here. It exists in this classroom, it exists in our school. And this um, I started doing more intentionally after actually when I was at Georgetown. Um, I was there during uh, when Fred Gray was killed, and there was a lot of student unrest because they were like, this is next door, and nobody is saying anything. Nobody has even acknowledged that this is happening. None of our professors are talking about it. We, you know, and we are, we are grieving, we are furious. Um, they staged a die-in, you know, and the, the administration was like, whoa, what's going on? I mean, it was just, it was pretty awful. And, um, and so I just, it struck me the importance of acknowledging that and honoring that, both for our students, but also for the times that they're serving. Um, that when, you know, big traumatic things are happening in the world, um, you know, we're all humans. Um, but these more directly affect some of our students than others and, and certain subsets of clients. So like all of my, a lot of my students practicing immigration law right now are like, I, you know, all of my clients are in extreme limbo. They have no idea, you know, whether, you know, the rule that is the rule today is going to be that tomorrow, you know, and or I want to do this work because my parents are in that same situation, right? So, um, so I try and make it I, I try and model that by acknowledging some of the things that are going, but also trying to create space for kind of those kind of check-ins. Um, because I just, I find it's really easy to not, especially when in a lot of their classes, you know, faculty aren't updating their syllabi every semester. We don't even probably update our syllabi every semester, but at least creating a bit of space um, to, to kind of be real about that. So some recent examples, like I said, you know, when the Orlando, when you know, Orlando happened, school shootings, police shootings, Trump's travel bans, DACA, um, all of the things that affect not just the work, but, but affect the lives of, of the students that we work with. Um, the other thing I do in my kind of initial class is in, in professional identity, I try and spend time talking about the importance of integrity and the importance of trying to find roles that allow you to bring your whole self. Um, because I just, I think that's very related to to sustainability in the practice, as well as just you know feeling fulfilled in what you do, um, and I think law school can have this effect of feeling like it erases parts of you um, and erases um, strengths that you may have and that you may have gone on over the course of your life that I think are incredibly relevant to success as a practicing lawyer and to the kind of work we do as internship supervisors, and to, so to try and be intentional about that as well. 
Um, a couple of other things I do, I do in my ethics portion, which I actually, I co-teach with someone in career services, who's great, and I um, have them do the kind of more um, wonky side of ethics, and then I do an exercise on doing justice, um, where I've used a TED talk by Adam Foss, some of you may have seen, it's called A Prosecutor's Vision for a Better Justice System, um, and I, it's a, it's a, a prosecutor of color who always thought, well, I actually thought he'd go to private practice, then he thought he'd be a defender, and then became a prosecutor because of the ability he had, frankly, not to prosecute, um, and to say, you know, we need to ask broader questions about justice and about what we're doing when we uphold unthinkingly this criminal justice system that we have, um, and, you know, kind of does an exercise where he pans the audience, the TED Talk audience, to say, how many of you did this when you were young? You know, how many of you, you know, smoked weed, how many of you shoplifted something, you know, and how many of you had long-term consequences on your life because you did that, and you know, it's like one. Um, and so he's like, meanwhile, we have this system that by virtue of just, you know, practice and machinery repeatedly is disproportionately, you know, locking up, um, I mean, primarily young men of color, but, um, you know, and, and then I, you know, I chose this road because I have the opportunity to ex exercise my positional power in a different direction and say, you know, I'm going to use these alternative methods that I can. Um, and, and what I invite students to do is think about, you know, what does doing justice mean to get? What was his name again? Adam, Adam Foss. How do you spell the last name? F-O-S-S. F-O-S-S. Yeah, and if you just Google Adam Foss TED Talk, it'll, it'll come up. Um, and so I have students think about, even if they're not in a specifically social justice oriented placement, what does doing justice mean to them and what does that look like at their placement? And underlying that legal ethics are not always the same as moral ethics. And that I think that you know it's imperative, yes, that we follow legal ethics, that we also, but that we be driven by moral ethics and I think a sense of what is right and what is just. Um, Another thing I do is I do um, I do a class session on implicit bias that's pretty thorough. I, I'm not going to present on that just because I have at previous conferences, but I'm happy to share on it. Um, I, I use a TED Talk there too. I use Jerry Kenning's TED Talk, which is good. Um, the judicial one or the, the immaculate I, perception? I use immaculate perception. I find it a bit more entertaining. Um, and then I, but I add a whole piece on and how we see this play out. Um, that kind of contemporary contemporizes it. Um, I'm struggling, to be totally honest, a little bit with this session right now because despite that I get usually a lot of student gratitude afterwards, I, I feel like it feels so incomplete to me. I feel like I raise all of the areas where bias plays out and what I want to do is be able to more effectively give students tools to resist that. Um, I feel like I'm giving them tools that when they are in positions of power, like when they are supervisors and running organizations, I'm giving them some tools as to how not reproduce bias within their organizations. Um, what I would like to be able to do better is when a student is in a situation where they are the target of that bias, help empower them to have the support to either, yeah, go ahead. I was, so we here, I'm at UCLA, and we have Jerry Pond. Yeah. And on the opposite side of that, we have so we have Daniel Solorzano, who okay. does work on critical race theory. Right. And I've actually seen them in conversation where Solorzano often says, I don't do the work of the person who has the biases, I do the work on the side of those that are on the receiving end of the bias. Yeah. And he addresses it in some articles around racial battle with Pete. Okay, okay, right. And so, because I feel like that's the part that I'm trying to beef up now so that there's a balanced conversation there. And so, Lord, so, so yeah, Danny, okay. Daniel Solorzano, S O L O. It's phonetic. What did you say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Um, and and so that, and then he that had a graduate right. student who I think is at Michigan now. She might be at UC Riverside. She did um, Tara Yoso, Y O S O, and she does work around um, community cultural wealth which helps with some of the imposter syndrome because it's looking at different forms of what you're bringing to the table that are not often seen as like the cultural capital and you do that, you know, for those models yes. in that area. Yep. That's another. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, I mean, I, I, I do feel like, I'm, I'm glad that I do it, but that's an area where I feel like I could constantly improve, but I, I feel like it opens, again, it opens up conversations, and it has students bring back and reflect on things that I think they're not always, some of them are not always paying attention to. Um, and then the other thing I do is I, I kind of try at the end, you know, I, and, and again, this isn't explicit as much, but have a self a self care and a work life balance component, um, because I just, I think for all students that's important, but I think, um, you know, at least in my experience, a lot of students from underrepresented backgrounds are kind of the most overextended in both in school, but often, I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot that's on their plate, there's a lot that can be on their plate, not even just at school, but outside of school. 
Um, and, and so trying to create some space to, to reflect and problem solve, you know, kind of, so how is this going to be manageable? And where are my drawing strength and what are my supports um, inside myself and outside myself? Um, and then just outside of class, and I'll just kind of go through these quickly. I mean, I think I, I do a lot of informal counseling, as I'm sure all of you do, and I find that when I intentionally bring up issues of, you know, of power and privilege and a more critical lens in class, I get students wanting to come and explore those things more interpersonally, which I'm always glad to do. Um, I make connections and open doors with where possible. We're fortunate to have a very, very diverse faculty, and so when we're talking about um, opportunities, particularly for students of color, we have a lot of faculty that I work with very closely to open doors. We have a great pipeline under the California Supreme Court, which is probably the only court in the country where there are no white men. Um, we, you know, I, I do a lot of work directly with student identity orgs to make sure that I'm both doing outreach, cultivating relationships, and um, identifying opportunities that are meeting student needs. Um, we have public interest office hours um, that serves a broad range of students. Um, and then the other, as of starting this year, I've been uh, running a support program for our first generation, our students who are first generation college students, um, which again, it, I feel like that more leads more to the relationship piece, but where I'm able to work directly with students. Um, so I feel like that was a bit all over the place, but I wanted to give a mix of some concrete examples as well as ways that I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure your constellation of hats are all different, but ways that, you know, hopefully we all can try to weave this through the multiple hats that we wear. Um, so I think I'm up next. Can I go next? Okay, I think it's I started sorry. speaking, so I'm going to continue speaking. I apologize if I'm in order. Um, so, um, and we're going to each sort of give a little bit of a spiel, and I don't think we've laid out the lay of the land. Um, but then I think we're hoping that we can sort of have a group discussion about what you all do, also, also what kind of, you know, questions and challenges um, you have on these really tough issues. So, um, I, I want to move a little bit toward um, sort of what we do with our supervisors if we do anything on these issues. Um, I think it's, um, you know, really, really important, and uh, I, I know the four of us, and, and I'm sure you all do too, to talk about <coughs> the issues in the classroom, right? Um, talk about them in, in reflection, right? All these things are important, but we want to talk about them with our students. But I think we do a little bit of a disservice if we don't think, if we send them out, even if they're armed, ready to go, right? Um, and sort of have thought about, you know, issues of race, gender, um, disability, et cetera, equity, power, but then they go out to a placement and they see very, they see no one who experiences life as they do, and that is the legal profession. I mean, frankly, look around the room, right? Like, there are very few of us who I imagine would identify as a member of a marginalized community without assuming I know everyone's background. Um, you know, I, I think law professors' roles are similar, right? Like, it, it, it models the legal profession, right? So, I think we have to be cognizant that, like, regardless of the training we give them and regardless of the things we talk, talk to them about, we're still, we have less control in this environment. And I feel like a lot of people are in the in-house clinical world when we went around introductions. And we have, while there are challenges in that role, you also have more control, right, of what you expose them to and who, who you're exposing them to, right? We don't as much, I think. So, um, so one of the things that I've sort of really struggled a little bit with is how can we broach these topics, help prepare these, um, our supervisors to deal with these topics. At Denver Law, which I think is a very big contrast to upcoming at Howard and, and, and certainly um, Sarah at Davis, we are about 25% students of color, um, and probably half that students who identify as LGBTQIA, um, and even a smaller portion who, identi um, who identify um, as having a disability, right? And those are, of course, not the only marginalized factors, but just sort of three, right? Um, uh, and women, we also have a lower majority of women, um, or women are in the minority, though not as much. Anyway, the point is, is we are not a very diverse place. Um, Denver is an interesting place. There's certainly a Latino population. Um, people sometimes struggle to find the black population. It exists. We are there. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's different, right? You're, not in a, you're in an urban area, but it's a, it's a, a different kind of makeup. So um, to me, that means, oh, yes, we have to talk about this stuff. We have to talk about this stuff like really big, right? Because the students who are marginalized are going to feel marginalized even more. And the students who aren't can get away with not necessarily thinking about this stuff because they're not facing it every day, right? So um, I want to mention three kind of things I think that I, I, I touch on on the supervisor side. One is the trainings, two are specific targeted programs, and three is a specific kind of seminar in which supervisors are very engaged. Um, one is a supervisor training. So we've, I think folks who have been in clinicians and other settings, um, many of us run some sort of training, formal training, oftentimes connected with CLE credits, et cetera, um, where we bring supervisors in our space, we feed them, right, and we give them a drink, and we thank them for all their work, and we try to talk about best practices and supervision, right? Historically, for us, that has often meant ethical questions that come up, um, how to abide by our program's requirements. These things are all important, and we still do them, right? But we have in the last um, you know, couple of times in which we've done a training, which we have usually do one or twice a year, um, we have, I have said that's not enough, right? Um, so what we focused on are things like wellness, things like power, and things like bias. 
um, because I am not convinced that all these people talk about this stuff in their placement. Um, and we, I should say we do private and public too, so there's a real range, right? Um, large law firm, corporate counsel, legal aid, PD, you name it, we have it. So what we do is, one, is they're often surprised because they are expecting um, to only talk about best practices and supervision. I believe these topics are related to best practices and supervision, so I'm very explicit in sort of saying that. Um, and we do a couple things, um, probably a little bit like um, the stuff Sarah described. We present research and stats on these issues, right? Um, they are real, right? They exist, and they also exist not just from the lawyer's um, perspective, but also the law student's perspective. I mean, there are there is there are studies out there now, thanks to I think some of the scholarship and work of folks in this space, um, that talk about um, law student stress, that talk about law student identity, right? So so I use those and I, and I we present that, right? Because I, I do think lawyers like to know that there's grounding, right, in what we do. I feel like I learned that from Susan, who talked about sort of analyzing the brain, right? Like, tell people why you're doing this stuff, right? Like, why there's a course of legitimate foundation here. Don't just say it. Then I present the stuff that they're more uncomfortable with, right? Like, your case studies. This is what Denver Law students have faced. For example, being told they're in this space only because they're diverse. Not being comfortable to ask anyone at the office about a question posed in their seminar because they feel uncomfortable asking about things like gender, for example, when they're the only woman in the space. Being told they don't make enough eye contact, even though <coughs> students culturally are taught to avoid eye contact. Be having their names mispronounced regularly. Having white externs' names being remembered, um, and students of color's externs' names not being remembered. Being told that they don't interact normally with people socially, and someone actually telling someone that they may have a social anxiety disorder as a feedback point. Um, dress code challenges, women being, being sort of forced to feel like they have to dress more formally than men. Um, women of different body types having different dress instructions, whether that be explicit or implicit. Um, people being unable to afford certain types of clothing, right? Um, these are things that I'm certain that students in New York schools have faced as well, and they are certainly just the tip of the iceberg. They are horrifying to me that I'm sending students out there, they're working, they're getting, they're focusing on their hard legal skills, but yet they're, these one incident like that can affect your entire semester, right? And your entire being, I think. So, um, one, then I ask supervisors, What's your reaction? What would you do? How would you handle? They have no idea. They literally have no idea. Maybe there's one, not, you know, one person who is like, well, I thought about this, right? Most people have no idea. So then we ask, and we talk about like how one would handle that, right? We brainstorm. Um, and we of course share this. I mean, these things aren't easy, right? There's no right answer, but at least we have to talk about it, right? Then I ask them, what if their office? What do their offices do, if anything, to create inclusive environments, right? So one will say, well, we have one diversity intern. Right? Um, okay. Um, that probably, I think, can create more marginal relations for that person, right? So um, I, I force them to think about what, if anything, they're actually doing, and then we talk about like, what they could do, right? And if we make it, I, I very much make that component a shared space, right? Someone might actually be doing something, so let's copy it if it seems to be working, right? And I'm not necessarily the expert, you know, just because I identify as a woman of color and in this space doesn't mean I know how to, how to make this work in different environments. But we actually are having this conversation, right? And we couple this again with wellness because I think you know our students have a, have a lot of stress, um, and part of that I think is legal education created and having to do so many different things. Um, but also I think two things: one, if you are marginalized, you are you are experiencing more stress, right? Um, we know that. Um, and then two, these if you experience these type of issues, it compounds your your sort of sense of wellness, right? So I don't think you can sort of separate these things. Um, and I have to say that the, our best feedback on our supervisor trainings is, is these trainings. They are uncomfortable initially, and they sort of are surprised that this is the topic. But then they say, you know, this made me think about something that I never would have done, or now I'm going back to that, that firm partner or the head DA to say, you know, like, maybe there's a power dynamic or an identity issue here we need to think about. I have, we haven't necessarily come up with a blanket solution, but we've at least, like, said we have to start focusing on this. And then we have follow-up, and we have had multiple sort of one-on-one, -on -one, almost kind of coaching of supervisors throughout some of, to do, work through some of these things. Um, another thing we do um, is we have what I would call maybe diversity structure programs. So how many people at their school have a program in which um, there's like a pledge to diversity? A large private firm says we will take interns as, right? It's like a thing that often career services run, right? Uh, we have often had this, this is um, out of our career service, they get paid an incredible amount of money, but it's basically a, you know, a diverse student, as defined by many different factors, gets in the door, right, of a large law firm that they probably wouldn't have gotten before. I think there are value in these programs, right? Um, I never participated in one because it wasn't my journey, but I, I am, it introduces a new area of life, it's a financial benefit for a lot of students who struggle, um, and I think many of these students would not get in the door, right, if we're not for these programs. With that said, I think we need to have other options, right? And I think these kinds of programs cannot be offered without like a focus on inclusivity. Because then you send these students in the door and they have they like they're really struggling, right? So what we have done is created um, two separate programs. 
One is with the, our Colorado Supreme Court and our Colorado um, Court of Appeals. Um, what is sort of more prestigious, right? Um, whether or not I believe in that, but it's true, right? What is more prestigious to be in these sort of judicial settings, right? These judicial settings often look at GPA. Uh, they often look at traditional markers of success. Students who are marginalized don't always have the chance to succeed at those traditional markers of success, right? We know the science, we know the life experiences. So um, we have no GPA requirement, right? And we have, um, we severe, seriously vet um, the judges and have one-on-one -on -one conversations and say, you ain't taking a student if you're not like aligned with this mentality, right? We cannot for, put a student in a, in a, in a situation that's gonna cause more marginalization. So we also talk to their clerks, because we also know that clerks are like a major player, right, in the role of judicial extraships. So um, we end up, the, uh, there's a member of the career office and us sort of have a conversation with the student. What do you want to do, right? Um, why do you want to work at this courthouse? We try to match them with a the judge that has interests. For example, we had a student who's native who wanted to do Supreme Court because he just thought, I should do Supreme Court. Well, it turns out he really wants to learn ICWA, which is an Indian Child Welfare Act. Turns out the Court of Appeal, that's, that's going to be in the appeals, and there's a judge who like really focuses on that. So we've made this wonderful marriage, right? So it's more about intentionality about the marriage of the judge and the student, just as much as getting them in the door. We have a breakfast before everything starts where we explicitly talk about, not just like, oh, hey, we're so excited to have diverse people in, in this space, but hey, like this is a real problem, and we have to like support these students. We have to give them the same assignments you would give any other student, right? But we also have to like bring up these conversations and be open to like talk about the facts of the case and how they may impact, you know, a different person depending on the lens in which they um, they come into that space, right? So I say this because, um, and like any program, of course, our supervisors have to go through a normal application and all that stuff. But we do extra because I just don't think you can have diversity programs without doing extra. I think you you cause you potentially could cause more risk, or excuse me, more harm. And it's not, to me, that's not worth it, right? But these students, I've having just had individual conversations with each of them, are having wonderful experiences. And I think that is because we have vetted out those judges that were not invested. And like maybe that means we have two fewer Supreme Court judges. But to me, that's more important, right? Um, because at least I know the people that are there get why we're there, right? And get um, what we're doing. Um, we have a similar program um, on a, a sort of broader public public sector, right? Lord knows that the public sector needs more diversity than anyone, right? And, and, and while we may be better, um, we still have a lot, like, a lot of letters to climb, right? Um, so we do, you know, DA, PD, various governmental agencies. We're very lucky we have a good amount of federal government agencies in Denver, et cetera. And similarly, um, do the same kind of, you know, vetting, et cetera. We also sort of take into account the specific, specific student situation. So we have a student who's blind. Well, he wanted to go to this office. Do you have the technology that is going to allow the student to contribute meaningfully? What he was almost placed in an office where they have everything's paper. He can't do paper, right? Like he needs, he has software. He comes with his own software there. But like you gotta have the computer for him to be able to like participate, right? Um, similarly, we have one student who's a black male, and he's like, you know, I really don't like being in spaces where there's no one. Like, well, I'm asking, like, do you have any black like attorneys at this office? Do you have any black people in power? If you don't, we're not sending the student here. He has explicitly told us, right, that this is not going to work for him. That type of, in, I think, individual counseling and engagement, both with supervisors and students. I think it's really important to make these programs work and to also expose students not just to the large private law firm, where they also need to be, if that's where they want to be, but also the judicial and public sectors, which desperately need them just as much, right? Um, the last thing I want to touch on is um, we have kind of morphed our seminar world a little bit, um, and we have kind of topics instead. And one of the things I did last summer, which I'll be doing again this summer, is a, is a specialized summer specifically focused on gender dynamics in the workplace. Um, and it has been um, one of the most gratifying um, teaching experiences for me, um, but also I think uh, really positive obviously for the students because we're naming, you know, that there's something going on and we're giving them the space. Like um, Sarah, we established community agreements. I, I for some reason, I like that term, but the ground rules. Um, yeah. also how we're going to talk about these things. Um, but, and we, you know, we touch on intersectionality, of course, within that. Um, but I also think we are, I am very engaged with getting supervisors in the space. And it's amazing how many female lawyers would love to come into your classroom and talk about this, right? Like, I mean, you grew, a lot of us are females in this room, we've all experienced things, right? Um, so we, we sort of do real life situations that they have faced, right? And we talk through them, like, what are the different ways you could get through this, right? Um, what would be the potential upsides and downsides of those strategies, right? Um, the reflection essays, then the students have to write some reflection essays. They're required to then like engage with the supervisor. When we ask them to engage with someone who's of the dominant culture there, the dominant identity, and the non-dominant identity, which in some cases could be women, the way it tends to have some more women, right? Um, but so we, we force them, we don't just allow them to participate in the summer and talk about these things theoretically, right? We force them to go back to their supervisor. Their supervisor knows what the structure of their seminar is, whether they like it or not, right? Um, and then we have a lot of people who come into the space, right? Um, and 
this has been also like a really, they're so, the students are so thirsty for it, and then I was very pleasantly surprised to see how thirsty the supervisors were, right? Which maybe is indicative of a much larger crisis, um, but nevertheless, I think we have that freedom and that flexibility to create those spaces, right? Um, and I kind of think we have a duty to do it, right? Because I don't think anyone else is really doing it. Um, so that's kind of the way I sort of try to think about like beyond like, you know, traditional seminar, which I also teach, how can we be a little bit more, push that envelope a little bit more and, and call out things like power, privilege, and identity um, so that our students at least know that we're also like, we're their cheerleaders on this. And we know it's not going to be perfect, but we're also trying to prepare the people that they are then going to work under. Oh, what's funny is I was, so I'm going to talk a little more specifically about one tool that I think um, all of us who do externships can use to sort of help create a more inclusive classroom that builds upon something that you already do, so hopefully it won't be too big a lift. Um, but it's funny, I was talking, we were having lunch and talking about um, this panel, what we were going to be talking about, and the one thing that I shared with um, uh, Lexi and Sarah, I said I wouldn't share here, and I'm about to lead with it right now, so I'm finding yeah. myself. Uh, so I call it. But I'm actually going to start with a story because I think it actually um, might help. Um, it's, help it's helping me think more about why this is so important to me. So um, when I was in law school and um, had to engage in a criminal justice clinic where I was, you know, in Roxbury criminal court and doing a defense clinic and I had a client who was down and out, you know, an African, he was an African immigrant client. Um, there I was wearing my little suit and I had my, my clinic professor or supervisor was a white man. And I'll never forget this period I'm talking about it 25 years later. Um, you know, my client, when I went to meet with him, he pulled me aside and he said, I don't want you, I want that man um, to be my lawyer. And at that time, he pointed to my supervisor. I remember just feeling, and I had to write a journal about it, and I remember just feeling so demoralized, and it just shook me to the core. I didn't know how, I didn't know what to, I didn't know how, I wasn't prepared for that comment. I wasn't prepared to then, thereafter, have to still go up and speak before the court, before the judge, tremble, feel like my client didn't even want me there, feel incredibly insecure, even more insecure than I already was, um, and, and, and sort of hold that. And so now, 25 years later, as I'm in this role, and I'm thinking about um, what I do as an externship professor, and so the thing I'm going to talk about now is reflection. So everybody here not only probably has, makes your students do it because it's ABA required, but obviously believes in the pedagogical value of having our students reflect on what they're doing, right? We all recognize that it's that magic ingredient that converts education, experience into education, quote. Um, it's not my book. Um, so what I'm going to proffer here is maybe something all of you do and know, but the idea of why we teach reflection, um, giving you a reason, and that reason being we teach reflection in a specific way so as to help create a more inclusive classroom. Um, so I've been trying to do more of that, and I found a way of teaching reflection that um, I've been utilizing that I feel really um, can do that. So let me start with that. And I think that that would have really helped me. Had I had those tools in that moment, because now I go back to that moment and I realize, oh, wait a minute, that's what was going on. Okay, that's what was going on for me, that's what was going on for my client, that's what was going on in the world around us at that time in Roxbury, Massachusetts, you know, in 1990, whatever it was. Um, so, so let me just lead with that story. So what I have um, realized is that if we can teach reflection in a way that opens up various dimensions of awareness, as it does, right, it makes us more self-aware, but if it can help make us more aware of ourselves, more aware of the people that we're working with, and more aware of the sort of political and social and economic realities that operate around us, that's how we teach our students how to reflect, then it can actually help create a more inclusive classroom by making us more, making students more able to identify their own implicit biases and making them more able to be empathetic and compassionate. And both of those things 
can help make a more creative class, more inclusive classroom. So there's actually been research, and so a lot of what I, a lot of where I've gotten, I've, I've received this information from, or this inspiration from, is Rhonda McGee, um, who many of you may um, be aware of. She's done a lot of work around um, sort of mindfulness and contemplative pedagogies and how they can help address implicit bias, identify implicit bias, and sort of ameliorate stereotype threat. Um, so I highly recommend uh, you look into her, read her work. Um, so I, I definitely want to do a shout out to her because I've done this. But she's found, a, she's done a lot of research in this area to actually find that um, increasing the capacity to identify implicit bias and increasing the capacity for compassion and empathy helps create inclusive classrooms in four ways. First, doing so can obviously help people actually develop the capacity to change those habits of bias, right? Like being aware of them is the first step. You can't, you can't change what you can't see. Um, it can increase the desire to take actions toward relieving the suffering of others, right? So that idea of compassion and empathy when you realize, oh, that's why my client was saying that because he is a man who is, has been victimized by the very system that he's about to stand in front of as a black man and I get it. I get why he would say that to me. I get why he would want a white man to be his representative and not me. Um, it helps create a sort of that, that, that compassion and empathy and, it, and an ability to identify implicit bias helps create this sort of inherent interconnectedness, right? Like that sort of, that, again, that idea of we are all in this together, we understand each other's pain. Um, and this is the most important, I think, in my story, which is that it can increase the capacity for students to emotionally regulate themselves, their reactions, right? So I'm not, in that moment, I don't just cry, crumble, and I'm not able to stand in front of the judge and actually represent my client like I was supposed to, or as Alexa pointed out, you know, one comment from a supervisor throws the student off for the whole day or the whole week or the whole month, but we can actually hold that, take that, Realize, okay, why am I feeling all of these things? Who am I? What is my life experience? What, what am I bringing to this moment? Why is that person saying that? What are they bringing to this moment? What, what, what biases do they have? And then large, on a larger scale, how do I, as a woman of color, you know, and, and this person, in that, in that story that I was telling you at the beginning, like why would he want a white man to represent him, again, in this sort of status quo environment that he's in? So, I found, and some of you may know, um, have, have come across Tim Casey's sort of reflective stages of learning approach to, to teaching reflection. Um, and at first when I read it, it felt very sort of, um, you know, just mechanical and linear, very linear to me. It didn't really register. But when I really honed in on the three stages, so he lays out these six stages of, of reflection and then sort of having students learn how to reflect. When you send them off and say, go reflect on your experience, or how, you know, what was it like for you to do this client intake? Tell me about that, right? Instead of saying that, actually guiding them through six different stages. Um, you know, did, and this, the six stages are, um, you know, did you meet the standard of competency in stage one? Stage two is, was there, was there more, uh, more ways that you could have accomplished what you did or experienced what you did? And then here's where it comes to what, I, what I'm really drawn to are the stage three, four, and five, the internal, external, and societal context stages. Um, so that's where I really want to focus in on, on this, this way of teaching reflection. Stage three asks the student to describe internal factors, namely her personal preferences, life experiences, biases, characteristics. What internal factors affected your performance or your experience or your reaction or your response? Um, and then the second, the, the, the stage four, the next stage, the external context, asks the student to consider the external factors. What were the preferences, experiences, biases, characteristics, characteristics of others in your interaction or your experience? And then my favorite is the societal factor one. Um, so that's the societal context that asks the student to consider societal factors, social, political, historical, economic realities that are impacting the environment that they're interacting with their client in or whatever interaction they're having with them. And 
Um, that fit is my favorite because I, um, like many of us here on this panel and many of you have sort of a, a social justice background. Um, and I also have a lot of um, sort of immersion in the world of critical race theory and critical legal studies. And so this has been a really great, this is a really great space to introduce students to that, to help them have that societal context. In fact, even Casey in his article recommends that you do that when you're teaching reflection, as you may know. Um, so using those three stages, I've found it really can help um, get students to identify their implicit bias, get students to be more empathetic. And then I'm going to just, just read you a quote from Rhonda McGlee that I love. Um, uh, that I think kind of sums this, sums this up in terms of how this works. By increasing capacity to identify implicit bias and by increasing capacity for compassion and empathy, we are better able to be aware of our thoughts and feelings with a greater degree of calm and with a more discerning eye. We are able to see things more clearly and within a larger perspective, all because we are a little more awake, a little more aware. And with this awareness comes a feeling of having more room to move, having more options, of being free to choose effective and appropriate responses in stressful situations rather than losing our equilibrium and sense of self as a result of feeling overwhelmed, thrown off balance by knee jerk reactions. So I think when we are engaging in conversations around race or tricky conversations, having, having that ability and giving our students that tool to kind of work through um, their own emotional responses can really help. Um, and help help us help those students understand where other students are coming from, and, and, and again just have that sense of interconnectedness. So I have afterwards. You are interested in just simple like examples of our reflection prompts that we use in our program that just have the have the call of the question and then you know ask them painstakingly internal factors, external factors, societal factors. I want you to so all our students when they do their reflections I have make sure they hit each one of them. And um, it's been great. It's also been really great um, when I have to grade these reflections because I can say, you didn't hit the societal factor. I really want to push you to do that. And usually when, they, when I do, um, something, something pretty great happens afterwards. So thanks. I'll have these here. All right. So my heart just started racing um, because you just nailed it. Ah. Like this notion of the need for assistance for students of color and other marginalized groups with coping. That feeling of being thrown off balance that makes you remember this story 25 years later, right? And in, in French, the, the verb is dérouter, like taken off of your route. Um, for baseball fans, it's the equivalent of being clotheslined and winded for the rest of the game. And I think as teachers, we have to give them tools because then they can't get what they need to get out of their placements because their level of effectiveness um, and what should, should be sort of them coming into contact with their own brilliance is, is sidetracked um, and abducted by the lack of training that the supervisors have because maybe they didn't need that training when they came in. I don't need training on how to relate to a 25-year-old white guy, right? When I was interviewing for law school, I mean, I, in law school for jobs, and, and in doing all my interviews and coming out and having good manners, like an immigrant father and a southern mother, and so I was saying, nice to have met you, Mr. Smith, and thank you for the interview, uh, Ms. Jones. And then my colleague down the hallway, one day, was coming out before I went in, and he said to the interviewing partner, oh, it was great meeting you, Bob. And all of a sudden, I thought, my classmates are seeing their peers, and these hiring people, our partners, are seeing themselves reflected in my colleagues. And I'm seeing someone from whom I am so distant. Uh, my friend's parents. I grew up in all majority institutions, so I'm seeing my friend's parents. But I wasn't seeing the person I would play golf with later. Um, and, and that was where I was. So that was just a, you know, what I do. Uh, I digress. Uh, so first, I used to teach in a majority setting. Um, and out of a 14-week semester, talking about race or bias might be like one isolated class, right, out of 14. Um, maybe two, right? 
Uh, and it was pain and awkward and felt unsafe. Um, and it made me think that it's the work of the majority faculty to teach white students about race because you know you guys have been white for a long time. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell a student how it is to be white and deal with race because I do not know. Um, but you are experts. Um, and so you can make a space more safe than I can as a black woman whom, as Jerry Ken says, gets hashtagged in all these ways, right? <laughs> so they don't know I went to prep school, that I went to all white schools, that I was a lacrosse goalie, that I ran a pub, like, that I have all these frat boy markers in truth. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> because I don't present that way. And so you, gotta, you have to do the work because I had trouble being effective in that, in that space. Um, now, as I said this morning, I work in Wakanda. Um, I am in a majority minority setting, and if you don't know the value of and the importance and the intensity of working in Wakanda, Google Jimmy Fallon, Chadwick Boseman, and listen to different black people talking to a black man about what it meant to have a superhero movie with them in it. And as I said to my husband, every one of those things is true. This is my first time, I'm going to be 50 years old this year, my first time seeing a movie that reflects me that is not rooted in suffering. Um, you know, and I, you know, I've spent like the last 15 years gently telling my mother-in-law, I appreciate this book about slavery and the resistance, <laughs> but he's two. Yeah. Um, like, how about like a book about baseball? Or you know, he loves women's shoes. Can we start there? Um, uh, so that, 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 like, yeah, that's a, just again a minor digression, but but sort of central to this notion that these conversations are so important where I am now. Right? We talk about race. Fifty, sixty percent of our classes. And it is not that I have assigned seven or eight class sessions to bias in the legal profession. It is that race permeates all that I do and all that I am. If you know nothing else about me, that's the most important thing that you can know. That when we are alone, we talk about race and we talk about y'all all the time. <laughs> because our identity is projected onto us and controls how we move about professional spaces, right? So the spaces where we would like to walk in and just be ourselves as professionals, we have been relegated and so we have to laugh our way through those things and work our way through those things and strategize our way through those things and it's part of our commitment to being effective, right? And as externship teachers, we are there to make our law students become effective lawyers. And so these conversations are critical from the people who feel identity imposed upon them and to the people who have the power to impose. You know, we spent a bunch of time in class last week doing the hashtag exercise and I pushed them around the identities they didn't put up, which often happens. Like, you're about to be, we're going to fast forward two years, attorney. You're going to be the one with power. You know, I don't, right, this semester, I have, I think, 11 black students and one white student. But you guys are all going to be in power. If you are in some room, you're going to be the one who creates someone else's experience. You know? So the next time you stick your hand in the judicial secretary's like, jar of Dove chocolates, remember that bag from Costco cost her a whole lot more of her salary than it's going to cost of yours before you take the stapler off her desk, because this was a thing. She gets so uptight when I take that whole touch off her desk. It's her space. Here you are, this uppity whippersnapper, you know, coming in, who's going to have power over her like every other lawyer. See yourselves, you know. See yourselves predominantly black, predominantly southern, disproportionately Christian, as living in a Christian nation, you know. Uh, so one of my students, um, whose Persian said, yeah, we can do a, so a history or what do you say, a cultural holiday for us, but you'll be kind of hungry because we're going to do Ramadan. 
you know, and, it, and the students weren't sure if they could laugh yet. So it was definitely a, a, a table turn, right? Of like, yeah, like there are things when you see yourself as the one who could be oppressed, like we all have the capacity to do that. And so um, that's part of my push. I mean, I guess no one else has that burden <laughs> of a majority minority setting, but that that's a push we have to always see that everyone has power on both sides, and we as lawyers always have it. I want to also reflect back quickly on something that was said in the plenary, you know, about uh, clinics being the real world, or the ideal, right? The laws that should be, and externships being practiced as it is. Well, after one year and 28 credits of getting to the point in which we believe law is neutral, that we can understand what a reasonable person is, we push them out summer after 1L, and they get a slap in the face with what the, the law is, right? They get asked if they're the co-defendant, if they're the client. They get told to stand up and get sworn in in housing court. Well, if you haven't trained the supervisors to say, look, you're black students, you're students of color that meet the demographic of this community, are going to get clotheslined. I, somewhat, I mean, I had a student who loves her placement, and she said, and my supervisor didn't stand up for me. She didn't know how humiliated I was that this person was telling me to swear in. And the supervisor didn't revisit it and didn't know to revisit it, but this student who's going to lead away, who's a total rock star, um, going to an office in New York with a large Howard alumni base, actually, like was so excited to meet with her mentor, one of her mentors and say, this happened. And the mentor said, oh, don't worry. Like, we've got you. We've got you here at New York Legal Aid. If you have students that are going to do legal aid and want to go east, New York Legal Aid is a safe space in a lot of the offices. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, I think a bunch, so that's, that's her story. Um, I think a bunch of you were probably around, I don't know, four years ago when some law professors in the Midwest wrote about their student being identified as a co-defendant and then wanted to know from all of us if they should ask the student to go through and workshop the experience in seminar. No, um, in case you were wondering what the response was. And I wrote several times privately to this professor who was trying to tell me how valuable it could be. And I had to sort of like be the Lorax and speak for the trees on this. Like, no, you cannot make this kid teach. Um, so that was two. Three, because I want to allow some of your time. Uh, back in the plenary, who we are. We are disproportionately female, which means, I think we, I just wanted to just point that out, that our work is impliedly less valued, whether that's in our larger institutional communities, or in how we're compensated, or how we're, or we're categorized, and so, um, it'd be great if the externships represented who we should be a little more, right? Because we all have the capacity to achieve a goal that puts, you know, Sandy's social justice mission into play, at least in our bubble of university settings, right? The goal I wrote was to move race and identity to the center of what we do, because for all of us, it is central to who we are, whether it is central to our cluelessness or central to our struggle. Uh, and to always be aware of how much space we are taking up and getting enough power that we can call each other out if we are taking up uh, a little too much, maybe. Um, you know, I will say on the black folks talking about black folks, I love it that every time Lexi, who is um, considerably darker than my fair southern black mother, identifies herself as the we, and they're like these looks. Um, like, like that's, I don't know, that's fun for me, and I hope it's fun for you. Um, but that, like, we are watching everything all the time because we, I'll say I know that I am not God, and that so many of us, um, know that we're not God and that we're trying we're trying to be understood and we, we know that there's movement on the on the side that doesn't understand us to want to understand and I feel like this is the audience this is the community 
that at least for three years can work to, to bridge that understanding and make this space at least a place where they say, I was ready, like this did happen, and my externship teacher like walked through, like that someone can be clueless and be a great person and a kind and gentle soul, but not see what I'm going through, and that by training them and training me, my supervisor was able to like check in with me, but I was also ready to sort of steal myself and like smile and make a joke about it, right? As, as Gene Co-Peter said, keep it light, keep it moving, right? So in that instance, to joke and say, now this always happens, no, I'm not the interpreter, I'm not the social worker, I'm not the party, I am the extern. Or in my case, I know I'm in the attorney line, sir. That would be because I'm an attorney. So I think we started a few minutes late, um, and we're hoping we could at least take around 15 minutes, which I feel like is going to be okay, um, to get folks um, questions, thoughts, challenges, ideas for how um, the experiences you have in your local communities, um, things that come up. Um, uh, so, great. Um, I, another way, and I, I, I'm sorry I had to step out for a minute if you address this, but another way that I've seen this whole issue play out is how supervisors and sometimes students talk about the clients. Mm -hmm. And that has been um, where the student is devastated in the placement because of the way people are talking about their, yes. their poverty-stricken clients of color. And then I've also seen it play out from the student in my learning from practice class uh, when we're dealing with these issues. Um, uh, the, the stereotypical, um, those people um, kind of comments. So I'm just wondering what your experience is with that and have you had to address it, handle it, how do you deal with it? I can, I have one comment I guess I had. Um, you know, um, where I've seen that a lot, um, which has been a little heartbreaking to me, is in like, the public defender community, right? Because um, we think, we stereotypically think it's going to be in a certain community, right? But it can be in those who I think also devote their their life um, to, to helping um, low-income communities of color. Um, and I think that, um, while I understand that work is incredibly hard, and having now been a PD is, you know, certainly, um, I have to recognize that I'm still an outsider to that. Um, but students will say um, how, they were, my client's crazy, or like they, yeah, we, you know, that client was saying, you know, the, the language in which they were speaking, you know, various, we could all insert, right, various things I would say. Um, and I sort of call them on that right there, and I say, I recognize that there may be some people in your office that talk that way, and you know, after 10 years of work, they're finding, you know, interesting ways to cope. Like, let me suggest you not cope that way, right, and talk about it. Um, and I will also talk to the supervisors. Like, I've had many conversations with supervisors about this, right? Um, and this is just one example. I think it happens a lot. But I think part of, like, I feel like part of what our consistent message is actually, like, calling it out, right? Like, for what it is. Um, rather than circling around it. And I think we can do that regardless of our own personal identity, right? Because I think it's important to say, yeah, like, that's something that happens. Like, and, and ask them some questions about it, right? But then ultimately, some, them saying, some things to me are just deemed not acceptable, right? And, like, that is, I think, our job to impose that, too, right? So that's kind of my approach in handling those things. I don't know if others have been thankful. Well, I, I struggle. So, it's, so being white, I actually totally accept this as um, I am a voice, I am a communicator that, that has to address this, right? So I have more obligation than the average bear. And, um, and so, well, I guess there's a lot of white people, so maybe I am the average bear. But anyway, so the, um, a lot of times I think that, that what you have to do is let people say things and not um, humiliate them, right? And so, so I struggle with this because it's like say stuff, then let's talk about it and, and move the needle, right? And so I just had this dialogue right now with a student who was talking about, he's a federal public defender and, um, and, and talking about this 19 year old who is you know, making terrible decisions and he says he doesn't trust any of his lawyers. And so I told him, like, well, what do you think you would do to make him trust you? And, um, and so he said, oh, good thought, right? However, I could, um, the way he was talking about it, I could have just told him, like, you, you know, that is not you being, you know, a, a true lawyer. That is not you being in service to somebody. You know, why are you doing that? And so instead, I, I posed it as a thought experiment. That ended up working super well with him, right? And that's in um, 
sort of dialogue back and forth on his reflection. What I, so I felt good about that. Um, and so in case anybody knew, they were supposed to say like, oh, thanks, man. Um, however, what I didn't feel good about is that in class, um, you know, I often think that when I start talking about um, cultural difference, um, the class often goes well or less well, and sometimes bad, and I'll explain that, um, depending on what the first student says, right? And so, and so I often think, since I do it a little bit deep into the semester, that I've created enough community or whatever, I also kind of figure out if somebody wrote about something in an essay, I'm like, you know, we're going to discuss that pretty soon. Like, you should chime in, you know, and so kind of get my favorite people to say something first. Um, so in this class, the guy said, you know, all this is just about why I'm not, this is a white man, you know, why I don't count. And, uh, and you know, color doesn't matter, race doesn't matter. And um, he said, I don't know why we're doing this. And so he was, um, he's a big voice guy. And so he, you know, he, and I said, well, race matters because we actually see it. Like, you look at me, and without even thinking about it, you got me white, you know? And you look at other people, and we, you know, and it's, it's visible, and it's one of the things Americans do. And so you have to recognize that comes with baggage. Hey, Ray, I had the hardest time moving that to an opening up discussion because I kind of wanted to shut him down, but I also kind of felt like I'm not supposed to shut him down because I just told everybody that this is a safe space and we should be able to talk about it. And so I felt fairly incompetent. Um, and so if you have tricks for me the next time, and that's who I like worry about. You know, yeah. the person who's either explicitly, I'm not going to do this, or quietly, I'm not going to do this. And um, I'm not good at it. Two quick things. Uh, one thing is I tell a, a short story about being in college. One of my lacrosse buddies, uh, Todd, real name, uh, <laughs> drove a Jeep, uh, wore white baseball cap backwards, uh, came up to me, put his arm around me at, a, at the pub, and said, you know, Carmi, you're too cool to be a chick. You should have been a dude. And I tell that story because students quickly grasp onto the notion that if Todd were a little more advanced at 19, he would have understood that I could both be cool and a chick. And that being race conscious was, or being gender conscious, was a point of growth in our friendship. Right? Like, yo, Todd, man, I'm chick, I'm feminist, a lot of things, and like, come with me. Um, and that, because that's such an, an easy, non-threatening, and there's like this laughable across plane stereotype, that's, I've had students get it like that. Like, oh. Oh yeah, so yeah, I, I shouldn't be pushing everyone to just be American or whatever it is. Um, a, a game tool I used to use was I used to play Life. Do you guys remember that game? Mm -hmm. And I used to have them draw a board. Like I was just like, in the middle of the semester, and I'd say like, you, half the team does civil and half does criminal. And I'd say, you know, the beginning class, I put down a piece of paper. Back when paper was normal, um, <laughs> and you know. After years and years of working at your law firm or in your government job or, whatever, or wherever you are, a friend of yours who's uh, like working with a venture capital firm is trying to put out a board game for law students. And so we need you to draw a board um, for this phase of the game or this stack of cards called like get into court. And so we would make, I would have them write all the challenge, the logistical challenges of getting to court. Like why would someone be late? Why would someone not show up? And so like getting them through things that exist, right? Like bus fare, clean clothes, you know, um, having to wait all day at the southern New England like power fair to get their, like to get credit for the winter um, so that they could keep their heat on all, all winter. But all these things that would just sort of humanize this condition of people that, in most cases, can get from point A to point B with an Uber or with some level of ease, and then sort of have these cards based on different people's placements, um, which meant they were like dealing with a common space.
I was just going to say one way that when I, so when we, when Carly and I worked at the Richard Shannon Magnet, I was in that program into one class I thought was a two part conscientious lawyering seminar. And it was interesting because we would have a mix of students that like wanted to be there because they wanted to be there. And the students were like, it was the only one that fit my schedule. And so that's why they were there. And sometimes they were not as just, yeah, they, they didn't want to learn about bias. They didn't, you know. And, and so I, sometimes I actually found, and I don't always believe in going with facts and whatever, but I did find that there sometimes having fat, I mean, like, no, we are not colorblind. Would you like me to show you? I can show you in like 50 different ways. Um, or even like your example for microaggression there, even still, I have uh, slides that are, just because I think I think a lot of students, I mean, tons of students are like, yes, I know exactly what they are because I experience them all the time. Um, I think a lot of students that haven't really, you know, and so, I, and I intentionally choose ones that are illustrative in that way, where they're even a veiled compliment, you know, oh, you know, you're gay, but you're the greatest guy ever, you know, the ones where it's like, yeah, Mean? Like what? As opposed to what? Um, and so, in part, and I invite students that want to participate too. But again, I always want to avoid putting students in an explicit teaching role. Um, and so, sometimes doing that work to back up things, I feel like then I can, I you know, then if a student asks something, that's I what. I felt like I needed to open it up so the other students could chime in, and I yeah. didn't make it safe for other students to just say, huh? Yeah, I mean, I had Sorry. students say in our class. Yeah when we did our gender, or yeah. our lean-in class, yeah. um, or maybe when I was doing it alone after you had left. Too. Um, well, the numbers of women partners will add up as soon as the number of women going to law school catches up to men. And I was You're like, right. yes! That like that. <laughs> <laughs> we already have um, that Because they, they just don't believe that's happening. They think that they're the ones right. who are the first sort of gender parity right. generation to come through law right. schools. So some of it's just, they don't know what they're talking about. Right. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, one of the more powerful sessions we had in that class was one semester when we had we had students assign a different range of reflective and mm -hmm. critical reading re like pieces, and we had four men of color read bell hooks that they had they had so kind of amazing. unknowingly signed up for. Right. And it was like it was amazing. It was the shortest article. That's it why they showed it. Exactly. Yeah. Probably. And it was like they all of a sudden were like, "Wow, I had all this perspective like about racial oppression, but I never really thought about feminism." I mean, but it was just, but it was this powerful educational moment of the class. Well, that's what I was. So what I was going to say, I, and it's funny, two things. One is I've had that experience um, where a white student kind of came out, and I felt in that moment like I had to take him on, and I was. In the same place as you, but maybe layered upon that, I was thinking I'm a woman of color, and what if I confront him? And it was intimidating, and I had a lot of anxiety around that. And then I did. My student, student, my female student of color, rose her hand and helped me. It was almost like she helped me. And all of a sudden, I felt like I had a community of of, of allies to help take that on with. But I, I can't say enough, just as a tool, about how valuable it's been to introduce students to critical race theory and critical legal theory, critical legal theory, sort of surreptitiously <coughs> around this idea of reflection. And then they don't hear it from me, they hear it from, you know, maybe another woman of color who's writing it, but they don't know that. And it's a, it's like on paper, and it's Bell Hooks or whoever it is, it's Angela Davis, and, and, and it transforms them in a different way. So I don't know, just to get them to realize that there can't be, so, you know, to take on the issue of, of, of you know, colorblind. Or whatever. Well, the class did end up, um, you know, glowing better. But the, the, I, I let him take up too many minutes, you know. And uh, but the fun thing, just that came from it, is then we were just talking about how we treat clients differently. This was at Brooklyn, and we allow um, private law firm placements. And so the real estate guy says, you know what? We have lots of Japanese clients. They never want to um, negotiate their contracts. So, you know, so my firm, they don't even tell them when the contract comes, you know, do you want to negotiate because they never do. And, um, and so, so we treat our white clients and our Japanese clients very differently. And, uh, and then the Chinese student raised the hand and goes, I know exactly why that is because that would be challenging somebody and it would be wrong, right? And so then we still could get to, to talk then about well, is that good lawyering? Right? It's it's efficient lawyering, but you know, like, do you want to presume that all your Japanese clients, you know, uh, are are not going to, you know, want to exercise that opportunity? And and so it ended up being better. And so maybe they were just kind of saving me from my own uh, uh, embarrassment. 
And I, I mean, I just like some of our, like, I think our tools that we use, regardless of what we're talking about, we use private note taking, right? We use quick write reflections. I mean, I think there are ways in which you can, like, I think bring up some of these topics in ways that it may be more um, easier for some people at, at some points. And I think there's a way to get more voices, whether they be voices that are aligned with your ideas or not, in, the, in those kind of ways, right? Um, or sending things just to you first and using those as prompts for discussion because that means someone in the room thinks this, whether it be something helpful or hurtful. Right. I think that could be really, really helpful, especially early on if you have a server for, or if you know, if you kind of know who the students are too, right? And what identity they come with and how they're going to share this stuff. So I, I have found that kind of stuff to be helpful. And I've also found how to follow up them and like, individual engagement, right? Like whether whether it's, I, I heard this comment, I, I can imagine that may have been problematic for you, you know, I'm sorry that that occurred, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think sometimes that like personal follow-up can be helpful, right? Because well, sometimes I did that with can. my students yeah. in the class, but yeah, I didn't go back to him. But you also, you also never know. I had a student who stared me down for the whole semester, and I was like, all right, this is my, you know, this is my guy. So I'm wasting, I'm wasting his time. <laughs> And he came up to me on the last class and said, I just wanted you to know that every week I've learned something, and this has been like one of my really good experiences in law school. And then like, you know, the next semester he had a friend visiting and like called me over. And I mean, I just, you know, and I had, I had hashtagged him, right? And even though I have a red, you know, Brooks Brothers vest in my bag, he was always wearing his like red North Face vest, and I'm like, oh, he's the red North Face vest guy. Um, and all of the, that's attached to that, and like, oh, you're going home to Darien. Like, I did all these things I shouldn't have done that we all do. Um, which, as teachers, right, I mean, there's a line, right? Are we committed to all of them? I'm not saying we have to be. I'm just saying, tell me. So these issues are obviously so critical. And I think it's so important that we get them out there up front for the externships. But they're so important. They affect law students from day one coming in, the classroom experience, their interactions with faculty, staff, every job, everything they have. And my question has always been, I can't believe I'm having this conversation for the first time with a 3L fall or spring student, and why is that on just us to start putting it out there in the context of field supervisors who don't bear the burden of this either? You know, and so I'm just kind of, um, you know, have a role, but I'm just, I, are there other parts of your curriculum or parts of the school that have taken this on to integrate it through the entire three-year experience? And is that a goal? We do now. Uh, we just started this fall, and it was a bias training for all incoming students. Okay. which I hope gets longer, it was an hour this year. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of room to grow, but right. um, it was a student request, and I think it will continue to hopefully grow. But, but, it's, but it's, I mean, it's such a point of entry, like it, it could, yeah. At UCLA, I, I'm an alum of UCLA, and I always felt like I felt like critical race studies should be a requirement for all mm -hmm. students. Um, yeah. I just wondered if you would. It's yeah. hard, at SU we've tried, to, we started out with orientation, and now we've made it a mandatory a mandatory training that happens for all students, and well, it's not mandatory, it's highly required, but all classes are canceled and faculty are, required, are heavily suggest, heavily encouraged to require their students to go. It was kind of a disaster this year, yeah. I mean, you know, there was pushback from the faculty, there was pushback from some faculty, there was pushback from students, they all just said, oh yeah, we don't have class, you know. So, it was in the, and there was a pushback originally to whether or not it should be mandatory or not. Um, so it's it's been, but it, the, the, the the desire is there to have it be more integrated and to have it not just be coming from the clinic. Right. I just wanted to add something, and you know, Jennifer mentioned the issues of privilege and power. Is some of our students, because we had an incident last semester at one of our students. Those students that are dealing with different types of familial status, whether they're parenting students, whether they're students who are raising siblings or taking care of elderly adults, um, whether it's a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or uncle, um, and how that plays into some of the conversations that will happen in the classrooms. And one of our students who is um, in California is <coughs> called, um, I think it's still called SNAP, which is the equivalent of the staff. So then in having conversations with, you know, then hearing the negative context of, you know, equating to sort of the wealth of the queen stereotype and what that did to the student and what it in having a conversation with even other peers within the school. Um, but I just, you know, 
Alice has walked in the room. So we thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you.